Picot, yeah. So thank you very much for having me here. So I came directly from dinner to, <laughs> uh, to give this talk. And uh, well, it's it's a blackboard talk in principle, but it's also the hottest day of the week today. So if I start not, maybe I turn turn the beamer. Um, so the title is strong homotopy algebras for high spin gravity in three dimensional uh, bosonization. And maybe the one of the aims of my talk is to explain. Uh, what's that and where we use that? Because it's not like we first, I don't know, fell in love with strong homotopy algebras and then started looking for applications and so on. We're almost forced to learn the subject to actually make progress in uh, some of our topics. And the, the main topic I'm working on are uh, higher spin gravities. In few words, what's that? Is an idea that uh, one can try to construct uh, quantum gravity models by looking for uh, higher spin extension of gravity, so so that on top of graviton you try to add some massless higher spin particle, and immediate consequence of that is that you is that you need uh, infinitely many of them. So the smallest multiplet where you have chances to make it work contains say all uh, fields of all spins uh, say in, in in one copy, and then graviton becomes just one small particular member of this uh, multiplet where some huge infinite dimensional symmetry is acting, and the hope is that this infinite dimensional symmetry. Uh, should help you to render these theories uh, finite or at least renormalizable, and there are some uh, observations uh, to support uh, this fact. Uh, good, uh, but it, so in principle, whole idea is a, is a synthesis of, of several ideas that are natural and ha already have been available on the market. Like if you go to supergravities, you know, the more supersymmetry, the better, but if you have too many, too much supersymmetry, you need higher spin particles. Uh, if you go to strings, then the string spectrum is full of higher spin states. They are, of course, important for consistency, but they're massive. But then you can add one more idea that probably in the high energy regime, where all these problems with quantum gravity are coming from, uh, masses can be neglected. So it may not be such a stupid idea just to look for uh, extensions of gravity with massless higher spin particles. So that's an idea, but I don't, I, I don't want to go into details of what we actually do here. I'll concentrate on the, on, on the higher structures. And uh, uh, yeah, what's that? So let me just uh, tell you the, the short version of the story. Uh, so uh, the, the, way, the way we construct these models is that we look uh, for now at the classical equations of motion. So in fact, the model we have in mind uh, was, was first constructed in the light cone gauge, which <laughs> is not maybe a thing to talk about at the highest structure uh, program, so it has no high structure. A uh, light cone gauge, uh, very nice to make uh, first steps, uh, uh, but then you want some covariant formulation, and this is where uh, we need all of that. And also, for, for time being, we abandon uh, the idea of action, which already happened to us maybe last week. Uh, we also abandoned the idea of P-structure. So uh, I wrote pre AKZ, I mean, not to, well, actually say what pre AKZ means mathematically. It's quote unquote in the sense that we will remove from AKZ everything but the last piece. So I will concentrate just on equations of motion. P-structure is not important for me now, and there are, of course, many names uh, for that. So then uh, I'll show you how, well, within certain framework to construct uh, a large class of integrable models, and our model is just one of those, uh, starting from what I call soft associative algebra. So in a sense, uh, you have an algebra, associative algebra that can be deformed. So in fact, you have a one parameter family of algebras. And uh, given this data, we can construct certain equations of motion and show that they, ha uh, despite being nonlinear uh, and non-trivial, they can be solved. So they're integrable uh, in a certain way. <coughs> so, but where do we find uh, lots of soft associative algebras? Of course, in deformation quantization, uh, we, well, we can ask how to quantize uh, algebra functions on Poisson manifold, and at least this way you have a lot of soft associative algebras. But unfortunately or fortunately, in practical applications, in particular to high spin gravity, uh, we need an extension of uh, deformation quantization to Poisson orbifolds. Is, uh, this, these are Poisson manifolds equipped with some discrete symmetries, and I think that's a generic case because nobody likes manifolds without symmetries. And in, in this case, uh, you can have several uh, deformations of the algebra, with, and uh, 
well, you always have conservative deformation, but uh, you can have others, and they are not covered by conservative formality, but luckily for us, in the simplest possible case, uh, we can do things by hand, and in, in fact, without all these words, there is a nice quantum mechanical model discovered by Wigner that illustrates what, what it, what, for, for the simplest uh, poisson orbifold, uh, how this quantization uh, can be done. And then, maybe if I have time, <coughs> I try to, well, say how to construct, uh, uh, with the help of some concevich like graphs, uh, an L-infinity algebra uh, that gives this specific model that we are working on. So here we were just lucky to, to, to have big class of integrable models, but out of these uh, we need some specific one, and uh, you need to do a bit more work uh, to actually see uh, local field theory rather than just <coughs> formally consistent equations of motion. And probably I, I won't have time, but I would like, uh, I will turn to three-dimensional bosonization, which is <coughs> about applying exactly the same structures, exactly the same L-infinity algebras I will construct, but in, in, in holographic context. So if you think about high-spin gravities, uh, well, some of them uh, have anti de Sitter space as a natural vacuum, then you, you remember about words ADS CFT, so which means that uh, there can be some nice uh, conformal field theory dual to them, and uh, indeed, uh, it's very easy to see that they should be dual to what's called vector models. Uh, so these are three-dimensional conformal field theories that describe lots of uh, second-order phase transitions in the real world. And recently, people discovered also uh, several uh, new dualities uh, in these models, in particular three-dimensional bosonization duality. And at least in the large and limit, this can be explained from all this higher spin and strong homotopy algebra uh, perspective as uniqueness of certain invariants that uh, play the role of correlation functions. And uh, what's nice about this story on its own is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I asked many people, but nobody gave me a counterexample. Uh, the, well, apart from this, there are probably no examples of L infinity algebras uh, that are actually physical symmetries. I mean, symmetry, well, uh, algebras that act on, on physical Hilbert space. And uh, here, the Hilbert space are certain operators in this vector model. So I think that's, that's nice in a sense. It's some uh, appearance of L infinity is actual symmetry of nature, so to say, because these models do describe uh, physics, but in a small and limit, of course, while many of these statements you need large end. Okay, that's, that's, that's the plan, and uh, let me come to the first point, which is uh, like uh, pre-AKZ, or I don't know, uh, uh, the version of AKZ where you remove everything uh, but the last piece. So let me have some few manifold N, so therefore there is a homological uh, vector field Q on it, and uh, I will need another manifold, uh, which is uh, associated with my space-time, and of course I will consider well, parity shifted version of the tangent bundle, and uh, the, the, the algebra functions here are, uh, well, can be recognized to be just the algebra of uh, differential forms, and a uh, natural differential here is just the run differential, and I will, of course, consider maps from here to here, which are called fields, and the condition for the uh, two differentials uh, to be consistent can be written well, in, like I will write in a physics way. Uh, so there was actually a closely related talk by Maxim last week, who gave all definitions I mean, in, 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 uh, in a very sophisticated way. So I will use only very simple down to earth uh, formulation of this. So, uh, oops. Uh, so the condition for these two differentials to be compatible can be written as something that you can interpret as a differential uh, as a partial differential equations and I will give examples shortly uh, for the systems like Einstein equations and so on so this is the setup I'm going to consider so I will be looking for uh, field theories of certain type that can be written like that and uh, uh, since I'm, I'm, I'm treating everything perturbatively, in fact, the word uh, Q manifold means for me just L infinity algebra. So I will actually tailor expand Q and we'll look at all these maps uh, one by one. So what I mean, in fact, is uh, L infinity algebra. And the, like, the simplest example I was already given last week in some talk is to take N uh, to be, well, parity shifted 
uh, Lie algebra, and then Q is just uh, chevalier Ellenberg uh, differential on, on this manifold. And then if you actually introduce these maps uh, in S fields, what you see are say, uh, just uh, Young-Mills uh, connections. And then uh, this equation of motion, uh, well, let me even write indices of the Lie algebra. So this equation of motion will be just flatness uh, condition for this uh, Lie algebra. And this is an example I'm going <laughs> to build on, uh, up to gravity and higher spin gravity. Okay, so uh, um, so let me take a concrete uh, Lie algebra here, uh, which is uh, some space-time uh, symmetry algebra like Poincaré algebra. Say Poincaré algebra in d dimensions. Then the generators of this algebra are canonically called translations and uh, Lorentz generators, and the corresponding, uh, well, let me write it in the way A, uh, corresponding gauge fields are known as uh, field bind and uh, spin connection. Then uh, the flatness condition for this case, uh, well, the flatness alone translations gives you the familiar uh, torsion constraint. So it just tells you that spin connection is not an independent field. You can solve it in terms of field bind. And uh, flatness along uh, Lorentz generators, uh, well, I'll, I'll write it like this, but in fact, it's useful maybe uh, to move this term on the left-hand side so that what you see is a Riemann two form, which is morally equivalent to Riemann tensor. So the last equation just tells you that Riemann tensor vanishes, so you are in flat space, maybe in some uh, <coughs> Uh, a natural coordinate. So this equation sets uh, Riemann, the entire Riemann tensor uh, to zero. Uh, good, so how to make this story a bit more interesting? For example, uh, people recently detected gravitational waves, so any formalism that pretends to be general should also detect gravitational waves in, in a mathematical sense. So in fact, we should not worry about this problem at all because there is general statement that goes back maybe to uh, Glenn Barnich and Maxim Grigoriev that if you have some partial differential equation or gauge field theory, hopefully formulated in some BVBRST terms, then you can always uh, find Q and phi, your, your, your Q manifold, so that equations of motion are equivalent to these ones. And in fact, of course, this Q is closely related to BRST charge. Uh, so what do you, well, I, I just say a few words, uh, ask Maxim for detail, in fact, uh, yeah, yes, for field theories, it, it, it will have to be infinite dimensional. So in fact, the interpretation, I'll give interpretation of uh, some of these coordinates, but roughly speaking, what happens is that you take BVBRST formulation of your favorite gauge theory, you do jet space extension, the way Maxim explained last time, so you already have <laughs> quite a few, well, infinitely many coordinates, and then you try to eliminate as many contractible pairs as possible. And then the result in Q, that you get is, is this one. And uh, basically, most of these coordinates, they have something to do with parameterization of your own shell jet space. Yes, yes, so different case. So, uh, but, but I think, the, well, so part of this statement is general, that anything can be written like that. But if you want something like Einstein equations, well, uh, written means quote unquote in the sense that nobody actually wrote it down in exactly this way, but you can prove you can. And I'll give example shortly, like how, how, how it looks like and what, uh, what is the technical problem. Uh, yeah, so I think in most cases, it's not maybe even useful for field theorists to write it like that, or it's, at least it's hard. Um, yes, but uh, maybe one uh, general comment. Yeah, so there is a, of course, uh, so I'm considering rather simple situation, but uh, the correct definition of all of this uh, is in terms of Q bundles and uh, things like that. So again, I referred to talk by Maxim last week. Uh, and this Q contains, of course, exactly the same deformation uh, information as uh, BRST Q. So uh, if, you, if you look at cohomologies of this Q, you get access to all the data you usually have in, in field theories. Uh, Maybe, yeah, some historical comments. Of course, um, this system 
has uh, hundreds of uh, origins depending on your background. Uh, so for me, I mean, the first, uh, they were introduced in this form by Sullivan uh, as uh, under the name free differential algebras many years ago to start in rational homotopy theory. Then the, this structure leaked into supergravity uh, world, uh, thanks to Neverhoys and Durefria. Then uh, it was picked by Vasiliev to study higher spin interactions and so on. And of course, all this AKZ, gauge PDE, and so on. There are many uh, closely related words. So just some uh, historical comments. Okay, so let's try to add some life in here, uh, so, uh, gravitational waves. And uh, again, I, may, uh, I refer maybe to some talks last week, uh, because if you have uh, a KZ model, then equations of motion are sort of generalized flatness condition. So that's why, I mean, so flatness condition can't describe any local uh, field theory. Uh, so you need to do something else. So if instead of symplectic structure, you have presymplectic one, then the equations of motion are not setting the entire uh, curvature to zero, they set in only part of it. So there is some part that uh, al uh, is allowed to be uh, alive. And in this case, obviously, if this thing, when you move it to the left, is equivalent to Riemann two form, then or to Riemann tensor, then Einstein equations, they just set Ricci part to zero, vacuum Einstein equations, set, uh, set Ricci part to zero. So what is uh, Riemann modulo Ricci? This is wild tensor. So the traceless part of uh, Riemann tensor is the wild tensor. So the projector that we need to apply here should somehow tell us that the only part that is allowed to survive has something to do with the wild tensor. This is kind of convoluted way of imposing Einstein equations. Instead of setting R menu to zero, you instead tell people which part of Riemann tensor is allowed to, to be non-zero. So uh, therefore, I will have to add uh, more coordinates to this n, and the first coordinate I will have to add, so I already have e and omega, and I, I apologize for calling coordinates and associated fields the same way. Uh, so these are degree one coordinates, and I will have to add uh, degree zero coordinate, that is a, a tensor with four indices, anti-symmetric in each pair, and has additional uh, symmetry uh, condition that can be depicted by this Young diagram, so it looks like a wild tensor, and, and of course it's traceless. So in order to activate gravitational wave, waves and things like that, what I'll have to write here is this term, because it now it tells me that Ricci part can be zero, but the wild tensor may not vanish, and in fact it will be parameterized by this new, uh, by the field associated with this uh, uh, new coordinate c. So now I have. So I introduce a new coordinate and the associated field that plays the role of wild tensor. So now this equation tells you that uh, Riemann tensor is equal to something that looks like wild. So Ricci is zero because this thing is traceless. So Ricci part is zero. You have your Einstein equations, but full Riemann cannot be zero. So what, what remains? What remains is this thing. And this is like one of the coordinates to parameterize Which defines, yeah, 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 so now CAB, well, being uh, originally new coordinate of field, now it, it becomes identified with the wild tensor, which is a traceless part. Uh, who, what? Well, well, I have, no, 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 it's, it's, it's NED, it's NED. So, uh, so, 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 so first of all, form degree should match. Like you have omega, omega, d omega, so this is a two form thing. So field by and field by makes, makes it, into two form. <laughs> yes, yes, so we've, yeah, we first solve for omega as a function of, we plug it here, then we get, uh, get Riemann tensor, we contract indices, uh, you get Ricci zero, we uncontract in a sense, uh, uh, look at the traceless part of Riemann, then it, it gets identified with this C. So C becomes wild tensor and then you go on. Yes, uh, so, so we introduced new coordinate, new field to encode Einstein equation. Uh, but uh, since it's a new coordinate, I have to tell you what skew of that is. And if I go back to the field theory language, which might be easier to understand, then uh, of course, wild tensor satisfy Bianchi identity. So some derivatives of wild tensor vanish, some not, so I have exactly the same problem as before, that I want somehow to tell you what the kernel is, to parameterize it somehow, and so on. And uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm not going to write equations, but so the next coordinate that you have to introduce uh, has the symmetry of this diagram. So it's uh, while tensor plus one box, and uh, it's exactly the Bianca identity that tell you that all other derivatives uh, vanish, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what? Hmm? Yeah, they are all zero degrees. So these are degree one coordinates, these are all degree zero. Well, because I have to tell you what Q of C is, and in the field uh, theory language, I will have to tell you that, uh, well, covariant derivative of C uh, cannot vanish completely, because this will just trivialize wild tensor. There is certain part of Bianca identity, well, there is certain derivative of wild tensor that is not zero because of Bianca identity, right? Because if, if, uh, if just, derivative of wild tensor vanishes, which means wild tensor is constant, so you lost your gravitational waves. So some derivative of wild tensor must not vanish. Which one? Uh, the one that has symmetry of this fifth rank tensor, and so on and so forth. And then as long as I introduce this coordinate to tell you which, <laughs> which derivative of wild tensor cannot vanish, well, I will have to tell you what Q of this is, and so on and so on, never ending story. You're right, so uh, this uh, manifold is infinite dimensional, uh, but uh, looking uh, at this uh, story from an infinity point of view, we of course see uh, something that you can associate with L2 maps, just by linear maps, yes? Ah, well, if you're in three dimensions, then Einstein equations are just flatness uh, can be. Ah, yes, I can. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, while tensor will still be zero. So unless you activate, well, you can have cosmological constant, but cosmological constant is a uh, non-triviality of scalar uh, curvature. So you still, yeah, if you need the, the yeah, yeah, so if you need dynamics in a dimension greater than three, you have to have these and all the descendants, and all together they sort of parameterize gravitational waves in the sense that if you take linearized solution, then here you see your, your, your wave with some polarization tensor, and, and these guys are just derivative of it. Um, okay, good, so, so here we of course see L2 maps in the sense uh, some bilinear maps, and the L infinity relations tell us, well, there's something that we already knew, that there is a Lie algebra behind. Uh, so, funny enough, so we also have a trilinear map, uh, which is a certain cycle, chevalier lindbergh cycle of this Lie algebra. But the problem here is not only that we have infinitely many coordinates. These uh, equations or structure maps, they become more and more nonlinear as you go down, which I'm not going to do, like the, the higher, uh, in these coordinates you go, the messy the equations are. So nobody actually knows them in a closed form. So in fact, uh, yes, in so in four dimensions, we wrote equations of motion of uh, self-dual Young-Mills and self-dual gravity, I just make remark here, that uh, for self-dual Young-Mills and uh, self-dual gravity, which is like four dimensional story. So while tensor doesn't have to vanish, only self-dual part of it has. Uh, you can actually write this thing in a closed form. And what's funny is that in a certain uh, field frame, uh, the only L infinity maps uh, you have are L2 and L3. So there is no L4 in higher structure maps. Of course, this is something uh, special because if you perform field redefinition uh, at the level of equations of motion, this would correspond to some coordinate change in Q-manifold, and this way you can activate many of these maps for no reason. So we found some uh, simple frame where only L2, L3 are available, but that's very special case of uh, self-dual young mills of gravity, which are nice integrable theories. So in general, it's, it's very hard to do that, and in principle, there is no reason because you know that all interesting information sits here in the Einstein equations, which are second order. Now I come to, well, higher spin gravity. Yes? Uh, sorry. Uh, I work with what? Oh, okay, there, there's one. Could you please remove the mask? <laughs> because it mutes completely.
Uh, I, 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 you, you want to write? Yeah, of course I can write. Uh, well, yeah, because uh, so here I just wanted to get Einstein equation, but if you want to get something more general, I don't know, like higher curvature, higher derivative gravity, of course it would be, uh, so this is just the simplest example. Uh, ah, no, 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 no. So in, in fact, uh, the true gauge symmetries here are diffuse, just by definition, and uh, local translations, local Lorentz. There are no gauge parameters associated with these guys. Uh, no, they are not there because. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, well, uh, so th these maps are of degree zero. So this is zero forms. This are one form. So for one forms, I have zero forms gauge parameters. For zero forms, I don't have degree minus one forms be gauge parameters. So there are no gauge symmetries associated with these guys. So I mean, gravity, you know, gravity in the frame-like formulation, it, uh, it, it, well, it has local translations once torsion is zero, or local Lorentz here, there are no extra symmetries, and diffuse, just. Yes? Well, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand that because it's the, okay. Uh, so this, yeah, this is zero form. So, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So all 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 other coordinates that complicate our life are of degree zero. So the uh, degree one coordinates they are just I mean associated with the usual gauge description of gravity or Young Mills or anything like that. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely, yes, yes. Yeah, you can wrap them into anchor and say, okay, I, I have an algebra. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but, 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 it's, it's, Yeah, I complicate my life for now. Yeah, so I'll explain why it can simplify. Uh, so, I, no, no, I, t I totally agree with uh, with you that this is a Lie algebra it and uh, there can be a better way of, of writing it. But uh, what I'm saying is that if you really want to see like how it looks like, like explicitly, uh, it, it's very complicated, no explicit form available apart, uh, well, from these examples we did actually this year. Uh, just for fun. So, uh, so in principle, yeah. What, what I was trying to say is that in principle, for usual gauge theories, probably uh, you don't have to do that because all interesting equations are say first, second order, so they are somewhere here. You can nicely encode them. For example, we have presymplectic approach, which sets to zero exactly what you want. But for higher spins, it's not the case because higher spins are roughly speaking uh, these these kind of fields, but with more indices. The more indices you have, more derivatives you can put in interaction, and this is what happens. So the higher the spin, the more derivatives you can have. So, and since the, the smallest multiplet where it works is infinite, then in principle you have theory with uh, infinitely many derivatives. Like every vertex may be local, but altogether you need infinitely many derivatives. And now the idea of uh, introducing some uh, coordinates or, or, or associated field to encode high and high derivative is not that stupid. So in the sense that you will need sooner or later uh, these uh, guys in your interactions. And then uh, since uh, higher spin symmetry mixes everything, uh, just uh, Lorentz covariant derivative is not <laughs> very well defined concept in this setting. So you, you do need some uh, higher structure uh, to, to, to encode these things. And this is what I'm slowly uh, coming to. Uh, yes. Okay. Mm. Yes. So for for higher spins, it, it makes sense. And there is also another thing that I don't quite understand uh, where it's coming from. Uh, so usually, so for field theories, a priori you have this, so you have an infinity algebra. And okay, may, many talks about that. For higher spins, somehow, L infinity algebra. Uh, like I put 
here, L infinity algebra always come from A infinity, and I put HS. For, for higher spins, somehow this is what happens, that all L infinity algebras we know in this setting, they originate in a very simple way from A infinity algebra, like Lie algebra, uh, you can construct Lie algebra from associative by defining uh, Lie, Lie, Lie bracket to be commutator. In the same way, you can anti-symmetrize, symmetrize an infinity map, you get L infinity. So what we're after is some A infinity algebra. And A infinity algebras, well, which is a strong homotopy extension of um, associative algebras, they are sort of more tractable, they are nicer. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, shows up in, uh, in the higher spin context. Maybe a uh, naive finite dimensional analogy is that if you look at simple finite dimensional Lie algebras, Cartan classification, you have nice things from SLN to exotic E8. If you look at finite uh, dimensional simple associative algebras, <laughs> you just have matrix algebras, GLN. There is no E8 and so on. So in some sense, A infinity may be you know, more boring, more constraining, uh, so more, more tractable. So, and we find um, A infinity algebra in the higher spin context uh, for some reason uh, that can be attributed to the fact that the symmetries that we start to gauge, so there is some analog, there is some higher spin extension uh, of these connections and uh, of this algebra uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, emerges as associative algebra to begin with. And this helps a lot. Uh, so maybe the reason is not quite understood, but it helps a lot in, in practice. So what I'm going to construct is not L infinity algebra, uh, but A infinity. And, uh, uh, yes, according to the plan, I, I, I try to construct some integrable models. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah, but the, no, no, no. So you, you, you will see, well, exactly what I mean. So, and, uh, uh, so this, uh, these models I'm going to construct, they are parameterized uh, by associative algebras, and they're integrable in the following sense, that uh, I will define some analog of lux pair in D dimensions, so, I mean, the obvious one. Uh, so if lux pair is, is a pair of, uh, well, two matrices or operators that satisfy this equation of motion, which looks like covariant constancy condition in one dimension, then in D dimensions, what I want to do is uh, to have system uh, like this, so I'll explain my notation shortly. So I, I'm already assuming uh, some kind of associative structure here. So I have one form, uh, so my N is, uh, uh, well, has coordinates of degree one and coordinates of degree zero. And in fact, uh, I, I know what associative product is, so I define uh, Lie bracket to be commutator. So don't, don't ask me exactly why now. Now it's not important, it will be important later because all algebras will be associative. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so, 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 uh, I, 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 well, yeah, if you wish, yeah, that there, there is some index. So, th the, there is a vector sp uh, space, and, uh, okay, so this N, is just as a vector space, it consists of component at degree one, uh, at degree zero, and uh, they are, in fact, well, just as vector spaces, they are the same, and I know how to, to define associative structure on them. I have associative algebra. As a vector space, it's vector space. I double it, uh, so I can write something like this. Uh, well, uh, sorry, yeah, it was just product, and then I, I <laughs> emphasize it, <laughs> which turned it into tensor product sign, which is wrong. So let me, let me say it in A, infi A infinity terms. So as A infinity, uh, so uh, A infinity as a vector space has two components and say elements from here, let me call it like A, B, C, from here U, V, W, and then uh, I have several bilinear maps. This one here just defines uh, associative uh, structure. These two uh, define uh, bimodule structure. Oops. Hmm? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So when you, yeah, so I automatically anti-symmetrize things uh, when I'm, yeah, I will write equations of motion. Yeah, and there is by module structure, UA is uh, minus UA, and then uh, A infinity relations just tell you what, what I started with, that you have associative algebra and some by module. So with this data, I can write this. We can call it lux fair in D dimension for the reason that you can trivially solve it with flatness uh, covariant constancy condition. You can solve it, say, as uh, G minus one DG. So, but I want to make system more interesting by introducing some Well, of course, it may not converge uh, and so on. Well, say, suppose uh, star is GLN, so you have just matrix algebra n by n matrices. I write like this, then of course, G minus one TG is computable. Uh, so, but uh, I want to write an untrivial system <coughs> that starts, say, with, with the same data. Uh, so, and related to this free one, oops. So let's have a look at the example of gravity again. Uh, yeah, here. So we see there is some trilinear map, and I told you that in principle there are various multilinear maps. So by default, I can uh, put here some trilinear map A A L plus blah 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 dot 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 trilinear map of type A L L plus dot dot dot. And well, this is uh, how I will look for. Um, an infinity algebra. So then, <coughs> the uh, good. So then, uh, the, the the main result here uh, consists in following: that under certain technical assumptions that I, I, I don't have time to discuss, but you can ask me later if you want. Under certain technical assumptions, the existence and actually explicit form of these maps can be provided as long as the underlying associative algebra can be deformed. So let, let me first <coughs> explain what it means to be deformed. So we have our original associative uh, structure, and then uh, there is a first order deformation. There is maybe second order deformation, and so on. And of course, they satisfy uh, obvious uh, compatibility conditions coming from associativity and uh, phi one can be recognized to be, well, it has to be non-trivial Hochschild Tuka cycle, I mean, for the whole thing uh, to make sense. So then as long as this is true, you can deform the algebra, I can easily write down uh, A infinity maps that you can turn into L infinity ones. For example, uh, the first a infinity map is something like this. So it looks like I, I, I'm just replacing deformation parameter with element of the algebra, but uh, it's not uh, that uh, naive. So, so if you look at the quartic map, it looks like this is what happening in the first approximation, but because uh, uh, lambda is just formal deformation parameter that commutes with everything, and here I have an element from the algebra, uh, you have some uh, correction terms here and so on. So there, is, there are explicit formulas uh, for all these guys, but this is how it works. As long as you can deform the algebra, out of these bilinear maps, I can cook up A infinity uh, structure maps, and this is more or less how it looks. So, so I nest them uh, in various ways into each other and uh, can check that A infinity relations are satisfied. Maybe a few words how it can be done. So what, what happens here is that we start from small A infinity algebra like that. Then we were able to find something like tangent vector in the space of A infinity algebras uh, by using uh, certain structures like braces and some relations among them. So we could find a tangent vector to the space of A infinity uh, algebras. And why, if you flow along this tangent vector, you find all these maps. But okay, these are some technicalities. What's important is that there are explicit formulas that start from here and give you something that is non-trivial, so you can check that you, you cannot eliminate these interactions from here, so this system is non-trivial, and uh, we claim it's integrable for the whole reason, that there is uh, a lax pair uh, type system that, not surprisingly, uh, 
is written in terms of the fully different product. So uh, to this system, I uh, associate another one. That's why it's in blue, because I mean, these letters are completely different. And uh, the structure here is in terms of the fully different product. And then you can construct uh, exact uh, solutions of that system in the following way. So it's something like A is uh, this blue A uh, plus, if I remember, D, D lambda, A, a uh, circle L plus dot 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 at lambda equals zero. And there is a similar formula. Uh, yes? Uh, that's fully different product. So I define another system, that's why it's in blue. So this is original product and the system has something to do with it. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, they're not equivalent. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. because if they were, then okay, I, I just do. Yes, exactly. So this system, uh, well, we sort of say that it's trivial in the sense that pure gauge solutions, I mean, if it makes sense, like convergence and so on, uh, it can be solved uh, explicitly. So this system is nonlinear, non-trivial. There is no field redefinition or change of coordinate on Q-manifold that eliminates this map for the reason that this is non-trivial Hochschild cycle. But you can write the exact solution of, of this white one in terms of blue one. So that's how we understand integrability. So now what it has to do with the higher spin gravity, uh, higher spin gravity is a just particular example of that. So we need specific associative algebra, and if we do all of this, so we get what we want up to one important subtlety. So let me come to... <coughs> hmm? Yes, yeah, so this this is L3 obtained from M3 we are anti-symmetrizing. Yeah, 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 but, but I have boring L infinity because it has only bilinear maps, uh, so my equations are just flatness. No, no, but it's just an associative product. You just sum it up, it's just... Yeah, yeah, it's the, yeah, it's this one. It's but it's just associative product, and then okay, I can operate in terms of uh, this associative product. So let me give an example. Yes. Uh, okay, so L3 is here. It's defined by anti-symmetrizing this. So this system is non-trivial. So now this system doesn't have any L3 and so on. It's trivial. So what we claim is that there is some explicit formula first term of which I'm writing here, that constructs exact solution of this system. Uh, it, it, no, no, it doesn't. I mean, it, 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 it is only in terms of uh, these fields. Ah, well, okay. So now if <laughs> you want to know how it works, yes, of course. If you go into detail, when you differentiate this product, well, you, you find phi one, and of course L3 is defined. So this is how they start canceling each other. But yeah, but it's not field redefinition of my original system. My original system is non-trivial. There is no redefinition that can remove this interaction. But there is another system that provides exact solution of that one. And uh, there's um, concrete uh, algebras that we face in practice to construct this higher spin gravities, and they have something to do with uh, extension of deformation quantization to Poisson or bifolds. So, of course, I don't have to well, say too many words about uh, deformation quantization, so the problem is, well, I think I call it H, to construct something like this, and we know how it happens. There's a Konsevich solution uh, where this Fg are functions on some Poisson manifold, and there is nice oops interpretation uh, by Katanev Felder of, of D of Konsevich graphs through Poisson sigma model. Uh, okay, but now imagine you have a Poisson manifold with some uh, discrete symmetries. I don't know, maybe I write something like this. So you have a bunch of reflections that uh, preserve Poisson structure. Then instead of C infinity of M, you, you might be interested in considering two complementary. Um, L, uh, 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 
algebras of functions. So let the group of discrete symmetries be gamma, and then you might be interested in functions invariant under gamma, which are same as functions on orbifold, or you can be interested in complementary algebra where you take C infinity of M and uh, extend this with, uh, with uh, symmetries from gamma. So element here is a pair of A of F gamma, say F prime gamma prime, and you multiply them in a twisted way. So F and then there is action of gamma, automorphism on F prime, and gammas you multiply as usual. So even, and I'll give example shortly, even for abelian gamma, this algebra is slightly non-commutative, even though non-commutativity is, uh, yeah, it's because of that. So then you can ask, well, can I deform this? And uh, how many times? Uh, so the general answer is, uh, you have uh, quite a few new deformations in general as compared to this one. This one is always there, uh, but you can have other deformations. These deformations are not captured by Kantsevich formality, and there is no general solution to the problem, but in uh, some cases of practical uh, value, uh, we can uh, do things by hand, and let me give the simplest example that uh, Wigner arrived at uh, without thinking, of course, about all these things, uh, which is R2Z2. So Wigner, around 1950, asked the following question. So if we have canonical commutation relations uh, and, and take the simplest possible Hamiltonian, which is uh, harmonic oscillator and derive quantum equations of motion. We know quantum equations of motion are correct, uh, which means that they're more important than <laughs> uh, canonical commutation relations. So he asked, well, uh, going from here to quantum equations of motion is obvious. Can you go back? If you have your quantum equations of motion associated with this Hamiltonian, what they tell you about uh, canonical commutation relations? And he found that they're not quite determinate. There is another parameter here that you can insert, and R is uh, an operator that performs uh, reflection, oops, uh, ref reflection on, on, the al on the algebra of uh, observable. So R, squ R square is to one, so you have uh, Z2, which is unit, and this, oper oh, well, okay, and this operator R. So if you have a two-dimensional plane, you extend it with obvious symmetry, which is reflection, uh, and uh, consider, say, this situation, where you extend your functions with some additional operator that realizes this. Hmm? Oh, so sorry, so yeah, <laughs> I was writing the same. Yeah, it's that lower too. Uh, yeah, so if you, if you look at, at this situation, then what you find is that there is another deformation here, which is uh, in principle on equal footing with, uh, uh, with original H. And uh, yeah, for this deformation, okay, so, uh, so this formula already defines what quantization is because with the help of this formula, you can in principle multiply any functions of P, Q, and R, and you know what it is. But would be nice to understand it from deformation quantization uh, point of view. But uh, for us, this algebra is important because this is exactly what we take to apply to this construction, to get higher spin gravity. I'm not going to explain how exactly you see, I don't know, extension of gravity if you take this, uh, but I think that's both nice example and it's also of uh, uh, practical uh, significance. Uh, but the same uh, algebra can be understood uh, in several different ways. So let me give another interpretation that is also well known. So l let us consider the, the even subalgebra, the subalgebra of functions even uh, uh, on the P and Q. So then it's well known that if you take Q square, P square, and uh, QP, then they form, well, they satisfy SP2 or SL2 commutation relations. So they form SL2. So moreover, if you, I don't know, call this uh, coordinate something like X1, x2, x3, then with respect to some metric x, uh, a, xb, eta, ab, which is just Casimir operator, turns out to be some fixed uh, number, some fixed constant. So you have fuzzy sphere or fuzzy hyperboloid depending on, on the signature on the re reality conditions 
uh, you can see here. So uh, the fact that uh, SL2 or SP2 Casimir is fixed uh, tells you that the even subalgebra can be understood as just quotient of a universal enveloping of SP2 over by, by the ideal that is generated by C2 minus uh, this fixed number. I think it's three fourths in some normalization. Good. So, uh, and, and, and here I'm talking just about situation lambda is zero. So we take the usual commutation relations. So then uh, they form sp2, I mean the even monomials, they form sp2. Therefore, enveloping of these even monomials uh, should have something to do with enveloping of sp2, and it does. Now, how we can understand this deformation from this point of view? Well, uh, you just need to unlock uh, this deformation. So uh, there is lambda is somewhere here. So then you have a one parameter family of algebras that depends on two parameters. One parameter is secretly here. So it's, it's present in, in the commutators H. And another parameter I introduced ex explicitly uh, in this question. So uh, you, can, you can understand the deformation quantization of this uh, simplest uh, Poisson or be fold in several different ways. For example, uh, it's just fuzzy sphere. And uh, this new deformation parameter is the, well, it has something to do with the uh, radius of your sphere. And this is what we need for high spin gravity, so I have maybe five minutes on that. So, uh, for, for uh, yeah, so, for, for, so we take for higher spin gravity this algebra and apply this construction. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the result is, uh, is a bit disappointing, uh, and I, uh, to explain why I should go back to this picture. So suppose we have a sigma model uh, like this. So the number of coordinates on, on your n manifold, on your super manifold is infinite. Moreover, you already know that these coordinates have something to do with uh, on shell jet space, so they parametrize the equations of motion, high and high derivatives of, of your fields. So uh, any harmless uh, change of coordinate on Q manifold uh, in terms of field theory can look like a horribly non-local field redefinition. So by default, if you're not careful about uh, coordinate system on Q manifold, you can get uh, some mess, uh, something completely nonsensical as a field theory. So that, this. Yes, yeah, so what I'm saying is that, uh, so we know that uh, if you write down uh, associated equations, then uh, these uh, high and higher coordinates are expressed as high and higher derivatives of your original field. For example, for example, wild tensor, hmm? yes, uh, for example, wild tensor is a second derivative of metric, then you have third, fourth, and so on. Now, imagine I wrote this nice system, then somebody came along and said, well, I don't quite like the coordinate system on your Q manifold, let me, rotated by 90 degrees or something like this. Uh, but from the point of view of the original system, this, this is gonna be some field redefinition. And if I'm not careful about I mean, how it looks in detail, then in principle it will involve infinitely many derivatives because I have uh, derivatives in this. Hmm? Yes, the simplest, uh, yeah, yeah, but what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, so, so the thing that looks quite unnatural from different, yeah. Uh, well, I, I write them, but I mean, as long as I do non-local field redefinitions, I'm fine. So this equation is just still. No, if no arbitrary coordinate change on n induces non-local, but. Okay, so let me let me give an example. So you have these coordinates c. Uh, which start with wild tensor and they encode, uh, well, k plus two or the derivatives of your metric. So wild tensor is a second derivative and so on, right? So you have this coordinate ck, they start with wild tensor uh, here. So, but in principle, you have infinitely many. Now I do some coordinate change. Say I send c, well, even c0, in c0 plus any function of this c that 
say, can be quadratic, trilinear, and uh, of course, by default, if you're not careful about what this function is, it's gonna be just infinite sum, see case, yeah, you'll have infinitely many derivatives, not, not nice. Yes, but all together, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the, su the subtlety that we don't quite understand here, except for example, that we already worked out, is that quite unnaturally from Q-manifold point of view, if you think about uh, field theories this way, there, uh, th there seems to be some preferred coordinate system on UQ manifold or something like this, where equations of motion have maximally local, maximally nice form. But if I do some, co well, some uh, unfortunate coordinate change, I can mess up the whole physics and so on. I'm just drawing attention to Absolutely, so the, the, this would be the safest option. Uh, uh, the safest option is to do uh, change of coordinates, well, which are quite restrictive, where infinitely many uh, coordinates don't meet each other. But, but this way you're already kind of saying that there is a preferred coordinate system in the Q-manifold, and a little bit you can rotate it. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, uh, so in fact, if we take this algebra and apply our construction, what we get is, uh, well, we, we get into a quite unfortunate field frame where things are non-local. And uh, the result that we're now mm, happy with, that paper from uh, uh, this year, is that uh, we could find, um, uh, well, not redefinition, but just uh, some other coordinate frame on this Q-manifold where uh, this map lead, leads to nice vertices. And just let me briefly explain how this happens in terms of, say, Kansevich graphs. So we have these LN maps. So they have, say, uh, like here, A, A, and number of these Ls. So they correspond to points, well, say, on a disk. Uh, then because our uh, poisson structure is, is, uh, is boring, is constant, uh, so it's just, uh, the Poisson bivector is just uh, this one. Uh, there are no uh, interesting bulk vertices coming from Kansevich. So in, in fact, what, uh, so we don't quite understand what we did, so I'm, I'm, I'm more asking. So we have a bunch of graphs like this, so there are no vertices of this type just because our Poisson uh, structure is constant. So now, they're all exponentiate, uh, like it would happen for Moyle while uh, star product, uh, but there are certain additional modulo here over which you have to integrate. And these uh, parameters that sit here, they uh, can be described in terms of uh, convex polygons. So if I have a space of convex polygons and the number of vertices here uh, has something, well, uh, has something to do with the number of arguments in this map, uh, then the, on this two-dimensional plane, the coordinates of these uh, should be put uh, in front of this Poisson vector in the exponent and integrated over the, the, the space of the corresponding convex polygons and so on. So this is how the right structure map looks like. And uh, one thing that, say, we don't understand is what would be extension of these beyond uh, this boring situation. So, I mean, we clearly see some uh, part of big configuration space. Uh, but uh, to make bridge to this story, I should probably say that uh, the first order deformation, the first order deformation of Moyle while star product, which, uh, which is equivalent to turning on H here, the first order deformation of Moyle while uh, star product uh, this phi one, which is a Hochschild uh, Tucker cycle, you can actually extract it, uh, but not from Kansevich formality, but from what's called Scheuchert-Siegen Kansevich formality, is an extension where 
you add differential forms as natural module over poly vectors, and on the Hochschild side, you add a Hochschild chains as a natural module over Hochschild co-chains. So there is an extension of Kantsevich formality worked out by Schochit uh, 20 years ago, and somehow out of this, you can extract first order deformation. But we need all orders. We need all orders nested in a funny way and also uh, coordinate system rotated so that we actually have a local field theory. So after you do all of this, but we just guess the result, what you get is something very similar to, I mean, Shoyhit, Tsigan uh, uh, Kansevich, or formality in general. Some configuration space integrals over convex polygons. You can also embed this thing into Grassmannian. Uh, yeah, but we're just curious uh, if a anyone actually <laughs> seen structures like that or uh, configuration spaces like that. So now let me just, uh, yeah, maybe in two minutes, uh, say a few words about three-dimensional bosonization and how it's related to this L infinity algebras. So what's three-dimensional bosonization? Uh, is, uh, uh, is a, a bunch of conjectured uh, dualities among vector models in three dimensions. So now I'm in three dimensions and I consider uh, conformal, uh, conformal field theories which have the following form. So it's uh, chern simons term plus uh, uh, any of the textbook actions uh, you want. So I can have a bunch of scalars d phi squared. I can have a bunch of uh, scalars gauged with some un or n symmetry gauged and uh, phi to the force interaction added but at the critical point. So this is Eisenhower model. Um, you can have free fermion, but okay, it's not uh, that free in the sense uh, you gauge some symmetry. Or you can have what's called the gross nouveau model or critical fermion that again you add uh, uh, quartic interaction here. So, and drive all of this into, uh, to conform points. So, all of these are conformal field theories. And the conjecture is that this theory, which is not free because uh, you have chern simons interaction here, that this theory is, let me see, describes exactly the same physics as this one, and this one describes exactly the same physics as this one. Uh, what, what I mean is that uh, it's a value of coupling at the critical point where beta function vanishes, so you have uh, Ising model there. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, wait, wait, so phi to the four, that's interaction. Phi squared squared, yeah, sorry? The comment? Ah, yes, yeah, Wilson Fisher fixed point. Uh, yes, so, uh, which means that anomalous dimensions, correlation functions, and so on uh, have to coincide uh, in these pairwise identified models. Uh, but since phi and psi are not even gauge invariant objects, the simplest operators here, which are your observables, are known uh, as higher spin currents, is when you take phi, many derivatives phi, stress tensor is a case where you have two derivatives here, but you can construct objects that in the free or large and limit are conserved. So they are tensors that are conserved, and the, exactly these tensors, if you think about them, okay, tensor, conserved tensor means there is some conserved current, means there is some symmetry, exactly these guys give you uh, higher spin symmetry, which can be identified in, in this case with um, while algebra or moyle while uh, star product. And uh, now in terms of these guys, which are the simplest uh, gauge invariant observables, the conjecture is that, say, correlation functions constructed out of uh, higher spin currents built out of phi should be exactly the same uh, uh, as the ones constructed uh, from fermions. Uh, I mean, uh, as derivative, so it's a uh, spin S tensor, yeah. So that's a conjecture. And then, uh, because of holography, because of ideas CFT correspondence, if you think about these theories as living uh, in four-dimensional anti deciter space, uh, it, it, it's, it's sort of clear that all these structures should uh, pro propagate, should leak uh, through ideas CFT correspondence uh, to, to the CFT side. And now, where you find this L infinity algebra? So. Uh, there is, there is uh, if you go to free or large and limit, so there is an algebra be, uh, built out of these currents, well, of the charges that correspond to these currents. And uh, you have currents themselves. So charges form your algebra, uh, currents form 
some module of your algebra. If you depart from large N or uh, non-interacting point, what happens is that currents are no longer conserved, but uh, the non-conservation that shows up here is an operator built of currents themselves. So they, they not conserve themselves. And if you think about what's going on, of course, uh, what happens is not that there is some deformation of this Lie algebra as a symmetry because currents are not conserved. What happens is that the whole package of a higher spin algebra together with the module uh, on which it acts should be deformed as an infinity algebra. And then you can show that there are certain invariants of these L-infinity algebras, which we computed to the leading order and they coincide with correlation functions, and you, you could show that they are unique. Uh, so in, in a sense, whatever the model with this property you give me, uh, and in this way, when you formulate things, uh, you don't even know if J constructed out of fermions or bosons. So that's why, I mean, it's a symmetry-based proof. Uh, so, um, so you can show that these invariants are unique, so it doesn't matter in which model you compute the correlation functions, they should be the same, which uh, proves in some sense three-dimensional bosonization, at least in the large and limit, but to me it gives <laughs> some ni nice realization of L infinity algebra as an algebra actually acting on um, uh, physical operators in vector models. Thank you very much, so I, I stop here. <laughs>